Good evening. I'd like to call this March 14th, 2023 school board regular meeting to order. Ms. Goodell, could you please take the roll? Uh, yes, Dr. Anderson? Here. Dr. Dimmick? Here. Ms. Downs? Here. Dr. Gould? Here. Dr. Ortiz? Here. Ms. Silverman? Here. And Ms. Tice? Here. Thank you. Thank you. If you all could join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If I could have a motion to adopt the agenda, please. Chair, I move that we adopt the agenda. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. May I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Tice. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. The agenda is adopted. And we're now at 2.01, progress update on communications and engagement. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Chair Downs, we appreciate the opportunity tonight uh, to share the second of a series of videos that we've put together. Uh, I want to thank Paul Swanson particularly uh, for some of his work pulling all of this together. But this uh, particular video speaks specifically to um, communication and engagement as it relates to our strategic plan here in the City of Falls Church. So with that, we'll turn it on. The communication and community engagement pillar of the FCCPS strategic plan seeks to meet people where they are with two-way, time-sensitive, multilingual, and accessible communications. So one tool we use in, um, in Falls Church City is Language Line to help communicate with families who maybe their primary language isn't English. And it's a great tool. It's helped many teachers and the interpreters um, are very fluent in the language and help form that connection between families. Um, they, this company, Language Line, has about 30, 380 dialects and languages that they are able to translate into. So something that is brand new this year is the Superintendents Forum, which I was invited to be a member of. The Superintendents Forum is a group of diverse members of our district, and we come together to collaborate on ideas on impacting our district with um, support systems for all staff members and really making sure that we are continuing to build healthy communication and engagement in our district. So class tag is an online communication tool and to keep the families update what's happening in their child's classroom. It's great for families who don't speak English. For example, I do have a family member who puts Spanish as their preference language in class tag. So everything that they, I put in class tag, they're able to see it in Spanish. Class tag has been a great addition to our parent communication toolbox. Um, it's really helpful that I have the ability to send all my messages to all my families in the language that they prefer. I have multiple families that prefer a language that's not English, so it makes it really easy for me to send a message and make sure that everybody is receiving the important information. Yo soy una de las madres de familia eh, que me que estoy agradecida con los profesores que en esta escuela me están mandando mensajes en español en la cuenta de Clasta. Y les agradezco que en ese tiempo, en esos mensajes, estoy bien agradecida porque sí estoy bien informada por las clases que le dan a mi hijo. Y les agradezco porque solo en ese lenguaje puedo yo hablar. Y en casi inglés yo no puedo, pero sí puedo en español. Ya con eso yo estoy bien conforme para yo enterarme cómo van mis hijos en la escuela. With Children at two of our elementary schools, there's never a lack of information to consume, and I really appreciate that the school division sent out the FCCPS communication survey to get parents feedback from you know, the amount of information, the frequency of information, the channels that the information comes from. Um, I really hope that they can take that information back and really fine tune and target uh, what the parents want, that one of their main audiences. One of the things that a parent liaison does to support uh, the parents is to help them um, translate since they are parents who are newcomers in the school system and they don't speak English. And then we do um, by helping them to pre-register in the school portal 
Also, we help them to gather documents to enroll the children in the school. For example, we help them to connect with the health department and get the TB test done and also immunization records and a physical exam. So the secondary campus has done a lot of different types of parent outreach, so um, we're always thinking strategically and trying to make sure that we're reaching our school community, so a lot of that has been through digital newsletters, schools G messages directly to students, but we've also had a lot of in-person events now that we've been able to. So those include rising transition nights for our middle schoolers and our high schoolers, curriculum evenings, encore evenings, and then specific IB sessions. So one example of the IB session is the IB pathways because we want to clarify and help parents understand kind of the different pathways that exist at the secondary level with MYP and then leading into the diploma program as well as um, soon to be the careers related program. Yeah, so we recognize that IB can be very uh, difficult to understand at times, so we've really tried to focus on clarifying and making things as simple as possible so that parents have the tools that they need to support their students. At FCCPS, communications is all about building relationships. We're wanting to meet people where they are in the language that they speak on the device that they want to use to receive the communications and information that we provide. Each morning begins with morning announcements, where every year we send out 1.1 million emails, providing information at the start of each day that you need to know and want to know. I think the level of outreach that we do in Falls Church is really important to providing equitable opportunities for all of our families to be involved in our students' learning. I think it's really important that we provide communication in a preferred, preferred language. language to parents so that they have the opportunities to engage with our families and engage with our school and also engage with each other. Thank you so much for that terrific video. And I have to say, Mr. Brett, it's nice to see your face. We usually hear your, your voice on these videos, but so it's actually really nice to see your face. Um, but you know, just a couple of things I'll throw out there. Um, the language line, I think, is terrific. We, um, Vice Chair Gould and I, actually were trained um, by Dr. Santiago on that. If um, people um, whose language, first language is not English come to our office hours, uh, that we're able to communicate with them. Uh, I'm a member of Dr. Noonan's Superintendent Forum, and I found that very enlightening. We have members from all over the system as a part of that group to really talk about um, system-wide issues, and I thought I think it's been a great group. Um, class tag. I was just actually in my updates. Uh, there was I know in Peak they specifically talked about this. Uh, teachers in Peak specifically talked about how much they like class tag, and had a shout out to Steve Knight for his help with that. Um, so I know that the the staff has been really helped happy with that. Um, appreciate the survey that went out. I know a lot of parents really appreciated that survey to have some input. And of course, you know, last but not least, morning announcements, which, you know, I, I really can't have my first cup of coffee until I've read morning announcements. So um, I'm sure my colleagues up here agree, you know, I think communication is one of our, our definitely our strong suits. And so thank you for highlighting. But, you know, you have, we haven't stopped with warning announcements, class tech, all these sort of innovative things that keep us um, really engaging with parents, especially parents who may not have English as their first language. Uh, I just think it's been fantastic to see a lot of the improvements and really building strength upon strength. So thank you so much for your leadership. I don't know if anyone has any other comments. Yes, Ms. Tice. I want to, uh, first of all, echo all the things that Chair Downs just said. I, I'm really proud of the communications that we do, and it's exciting to see that we're, we're constantly improving. I just had a question. Um, with the communication survey that went out, what the timeline might be on, I know it probably takes quite a while to process those results and kind of prioritize what to do with them. I was just curious what the status right. is. We are, we are working on that presentation right now. We're planning to uh, bring it to the board at the, uh, uh, at the work session on the 28th. That'll be part of the overall communications presentation that you requested. Great, thank you. Sure. Thank you again, Mr. Brett. That was terrific. Uh, we're gonna move on now to 3.01, uh, Women's History Month resolution. And I'm gonna read that resolution into uh, the record. 
Whereas the month of March is recognized as Women's History Month, and whereas Falls Church City Public Schools are committed to recognizing and celebrating the diverse cultures represented in our community, staff, and students, and whereas Congress first recognized Women's History Week in 1981, expanding to Women's History Month in 1987, and whereas women are over 51% of the population in the United States and 49% of the world population, and whereas women make up 47% of the United States workforce and 74% of the education workforce, and whereas diverse groups of women have been leaders of many of the social movements in the modern era, including voting rights, equal pay, and labor practices, and whereas celebrating Women's History Month is one way that we can honor the many contributions of women to our schools, our community, and our nation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board does hereby proclaim March 2023 as Women's History Month in Falls Church City Public Schools and urges all to respect and honor our diverse community and celebrate and build a culture of inclusivity and equity. If I could have someone uh, make a motion to approve this resolution. Yes, Ms. Heiss. Uh, I move that the school board approve and adopt resolution 03-23 Women's History Month as presented. Thank you. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries, and we have approved that resolution. We have one more resolution uh, this evening in our recognitions report section of the agenda, and this is uh, a resolution on Irish, on Irish American Heritage Month, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague to the left, an Irishman, <laughs> Vice Chair T. Gould. 55% according to <laughs> Ancestry. Whereas the month of March is recognized as Irish American Heritage Month, and whereas Falls Church City Public Schools are committed to recognizing and celebrating the diverse cultures represented in our community, staff, and students, and whereas Congress and President George H.W. Bush first recognized Irish American Heritage Month by a special proclamation in 1992, and whereas one in four adults in the United States have Irish ancestry, and whereas Irish people first chose to immigrate to the United States in 1715, and whereas there are currently over 30 million Irish Americans residing in the United States, and whereas celebrating Irish American Heritage Month is one way that we can honor the many contributions of Irish Americans to our schools, our community, and our nation, now therefore be it resolved that the Falls Church City Public School Board does hereby proclaim March 2, 2023 as Irish American Heritage Month in Falls Church City Public Schools and urges all to respect and honor our diverse community and celebrate and build a culture of inclusivity and equity. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Gold. May I have a motion to approve this resolution? Yes, Dr. Anderson. I move that the school board approve and adopt resolution 04-23, Irish American Heritage Month as presented. Thank you, could I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Yeah. All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. We're now going to move on to section 4.01, public comments and requests. Oh, so <laughs> Dr. Ortiz is signing the resolutions. Uh, and um, I believe we have four speakers this evening. And I'd like to call our first, oh, actually, let me read into the record. Uh, in accordance with school board policy BDDH, the time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. Additional written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to board members and for the record. Okay, we're at now at um, speaker number one, and I'd like to call Mr. Jeff Buck to the podium, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Buck. I'm a seventh grade civics economics teacher at Maryland Emily Henderson. I'm here tonight to speak on the topic of collective bargaining. I'd like to first thank the school board, Dr. Noonan, for allowing me this time to speak. I also want to thank everyone who's worked tirelessly, tirelessly on the collective bargaining committee these past two years. Um, I know it's been a long road ahead, a lot of hard work, um, and we had we finally kind of reached this historic moment in SCCPS. I'm very fortunate to work in such a caring community that really wants to provide an authentic voice and true representation uh, for FCCPS staff. I know many of my colleagues are very excited about this passage uh, of collective bargaining in the coming months. Uh, even with this excitement, there are some concerns with the scope of the resolution being presented. Um, I understand that entering collective bargaining can be uncertain and requires trust on both sides, um, but we cannot let the fear of the unknown minimize our collective bargaining resolution for future contracts. Uh, by limiting the amount of bargaining topics um, in the future, not including administration as a bargaining unit and the addition of a sunset clause could impact 
our competitiveness with our neighboring districts, uh, especially since Fairfax County recently passed a collective bargaining resolution with broad scope. Our community staff and students take great pride in SCCPS being one of the premier school districts in Virginia. Let us, con let us continue this uh, in our future um, with a strong collective bargaining resolution. Thank you again for taking the time to listen to my comments and all your hard work by everyone on the collective bargaining committee, uh, including Dr. Dimmick, Chair Downs, and Dr. Newton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Buck. Our next speaker is Ms. Pam Mahoney. Good evening, my name is Pam Mahoney and I'm speaking to you tonight as the president of the Falls Church City Education Association, the union of educators that represents hundreds of staff members in FCCPS. Thank you to the school board for including staff in your efforts to craft a collective bargaining resolution. Over 15 meetings, goals were shared, conflict was addressed and largely resolved, and relationships were built. FCCA is grateful for the process and hopes it bodes well for future collective bargaining. However, as you begin the process of formally considering the resolution tonight, FCCEA needs to go on the record as opposing a few elements of the draft. In the spirit of good faith bargaining, we believe that it's necessary for us to communicate these objections now so it's not a surprise later. Number one, the school board's draft resolution limits the scope of bargaining and completely freezes it after two contracts. No other school board across the state has limited the scope of bargaining like this. FCCEA believes that a wider scope of bargaining over working conditions is in the true spirit of collective bargaining. We understand and have accepted the board's desire to narrow the scope in the first agreement. However, limiting the scope in later contracts as well is not really in the spirit of true collective bargaining. Likewise, FCCA believes that the draft resolution that declares that a CBA is null and void 12 months after expiration is outside of normal practices. We believe it puts all parties in a place where contentious relations are much more likely. We've requested and you have rejected up to this point that this clause revert back to the original wording that was in the final draft, that was in the first draft resolution, which creates an evergreen clause in line with typical educator collective bargaining agreements. FCCA is excited to hold an election in the upcoming months to become the exclusive bargaining agent. We're optimistic about negotiating a good faith contract over wages, benefits, and some working conditions that will make sure that staff have a guaranteed, formalized seat at the table when decisions are made that will affect students and families whom we deeply care about. There is much to be celebrated in the draft resolution that you will consider tonight, and we look forward to future negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Our next speaker is Mr. Kenny George. Good evening. My name is Kenny George. I am a teacher at Meridian High School, spouse of a teacher at Oak Street Elementary School, and a parent of two children who will soon be in the FCCPS school system. I wanted to take the moment to thank all of, the, those, of, thank all of those of you who've worked on, invested your time and energy to work on this collective bargaining um, committee. So I'm here tonight to express gratitude for all of the work that the committee has put in to get us to the point um, in this process of drafting a collective bargaining resolution, but also to encourage the board to consider the potential that we could accomplish what, what we could accomplish working together in future years if we brought in the scope of um, this, this um, collective bargaining agreement. So I recently had the opportunity to attend a webinar on uh, bargaining for the common good, where I was able to hear from colleagues across the nation about how they were able to use bargaining in ways that promoted health and well-being, equity for underserved populations, and sustainable practices that help both the environment and the fiscal bottom line. Although we may not be there yet on a collective bargaining, I truly believe as a community we are earnest in our efforts to uphold and exceed our goals in equity, closing achievement gaps, health and well-being, and sustainability across social, economic, and environmental pillars. Let's not consider collective bargaining as something adversarial and restrict our efficacy. Rather, let's look at it as a tool we can use to attract the brightest talents to our little city, retain the great ones, and leverage all of them in a collective decision-making process that will only make our community stronger. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. George. And our final speaker this evening is Mr. Farrell Kelly. Good evening. Uh, my name is Farrell Kelly, and I'm a teacher at Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School. I'm a former Falls Church City resident, um, a National Board certified teacher, and a past Falls Church City Teacher of the Year. I'm also a former member of the Collective Bargaining Resolution Committee and a proud Irish American. So thank you. 
I wanted to take a moment tonight to speak with you as you take up the proposed collective bargaining resolution for a first reading tonight. As many of you have heard me say before, I'm excited and hopeful for the opportunities collective bargaining holds for all of us who care passionately about the Falls Church City public school system and ultimately about the children we all serve. For those of you who ran for office on a platform supporting collective bargaining, this is assuredly an exciting time as well. Upon hearing that we are on the cusp of passing a resolution, one of my colleagues wrote to me today to say that they have a spring in their step as they walk into their building that hasn't been there in years. I and many, many of our colleagues share this excitement. One of the things that traditionally makes Falls Church special is the faith that the superintendent and the school board have placed in their educators to craft curricula and systems that are responsive to student needs. Unlike some other districts, we have, for most of my career here, largely had the freedom to identify problems and use our professional acumen, our creativity, and our ability to effectively collaborate with each other as we work to solve problems and build paths for student success. The humanities class I'm lucky to teach is an example of this. Four years ago, working with colleagues, administrators, and the school board, we were able to build a pilot that now reaches almost half the students in the eighth grade at Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School and actively works to help students, quote, think critically, communicate clearly, and solve complex problems, end quote, as the original course prospectus puts it. Those skills are really what collective bargaining should be all about, recognizing that we all care immensely about this place and that we all want to see it thrive, we have the opportunity to work together to think critically from diverse perspectives, communicate clearly and honestly with each other, and identify and solve complex problems collaboratively rather than working in silos. While we had all hoped to be one of the first districts to pass a resolution, we now have the benefit of being able to look to Richmond, Fairfax, and other influential districts for ideas to make our own vision even stronger so that we can continue to lead others by our example. As you take up the draft resolution tonight, I hope you will consider the ways in which it affords all of us new possibilities. But I also hope you'll consider the ways in which it sometimes restricts the ability to collaborate or communicate openly about problems that we may not yet know we need to solve. I hope you'll consider the ways it respects all stakeholders. But I also hope you'll explore the ways in which it could be further improved to empower our collaborative work even more than it already does. I thank you for working to put a spring in all of our steps. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Okay, we're going to uh, move into our closed uh, meeting now. If someone could read us into close, we're at 5.01. Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter, personnel under section 2.2-3711A1 in particular, staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignations, staff retirement, staff performance, staff change of position, staff separation, dependent care leave, long-term medical leave, ch child care leave requests and leave of absence, advisory committee nominations, and student matters under section 2.2-3711A2, in particular non-resident employee tuition students and legal matters under section 2.2-3711A8, in particular consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by the public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. May I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Silverman. All those in favor say yes, yes. All those opposed say no. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move into close, and I'm not sure, could be, right, 30, 45 minutes? Okay, at the most. Okay, thank you. We'll be back.
Okay, welcome back. We are at 5.03. If someone could uh, make a motion to reconvene to open, please. Chair, I move that we reconvene to open. Thank you, Dr. Demick. May I have a second? Thank you, Vice Chair Gould. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Okay, thank you. Motion carries. We're at 6.01, and I now need someone to certify the closed meeting, please. Yes, that. Vice Chair Gould. Whereas the Falls Church City School Board has convened a closed meeting on this day pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Freedom, Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now, th now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and two, only such bu public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Vice Chair Cole. May I have a second? Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Ms. Goodell, could you please take the roll? Yes, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Dr. Gould? Yes. Dr. Ortiz? Yes. Ms. Silverman? Yes. And Ms. Tice? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're now at uh, Section 7, Consent Agenda, and you'll see in front of you uh, personnel items, advisory committee appointments, employee student tuition, status of tuition students, and of our Consent Agenda. I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to approve this Consent Agenda. And hearing no objections, the consent agenda is approved. We're now going to move on to 8.01, approval of Fairfax County Water Authority, deed of easement, and quick claim. And I'll turn it over to... Okay. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Ms. Minton. Tonight will be the, the Trisha Minton <laughs> show for everyone's enjoyment. Thank you. Ms. Minton, please. Not yet. Uh, good evening. Our partners at the general government has, have asked that the school board approve of... Uh, um, easement that is a deed of easement and quick claim for the um, land around Mustang Alley. There is a small portion of um, the easement up at the top corner near Haycock and the entrance of Mustang Alley that was not included in the earlier easement granted by the board that needs to be granted in order for water piping to go through to allow water to go to the economic development site right next to the high school. So in front of the board this evening for a review and consideration is a um, Fairfax County Water Authority deed of easement and quick claim. Are there any questions about this deed? And I know, thank you, Ms. Winston. I know you've, you've briefed us uh, previous to this, so I think we all understand what this is about. Okay, if I could have a motion, please. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Chair, I move that the school board authorize the, sorry, I move. I move that the school board authorize the school board chair to sign the Fairfax County Water Authority deed of easement and quit claim as presented, subject to changes approved by the superintendent that do not material, materially adversely affect the school board's position. Thank you, Dr. Demick. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ortiz. All those in favor say yes. <clears throat> yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, and we're now at 8.02, waiver of first reading and approval of, and adoption of second reading of policies. And I'll turn it back over to Ms. Minson. Thank you. We have four policies this evening for waiver of first reading, second reading, and adoption. All four of those were reviewed by the Virginia School Board Association's attorney and revised in the February 2023 policy update. Those policies are policies that the board had previously approved that have some tweaks proposed by the VSBA. They are, as always, when we have um, waiver first reading kind of perfunctory changes, I'm happy to walk through them policy by policy or would welcome any specific questions on policy BDDG minutes, GCPB resignation of staff members, IJD college and career readiness, and LI relations with educational accreditation agencies. Are there any questions about any of those four policies? All right, those are the policies for waiver of first reading this evening. Thank you, Ms. Minson. If I could have a motion, please, we're at 8.02. Yes, Ms. Silverman. I move that the, school, that the school board waive first reading and approve and adopt second reading of policies BDDG minutes, GCPB resignation of staff members, IJD college and career readiness, 
and LI relations with educational accreditation agencies as presented. Thank you. Could I have a second? Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Okay, thank you. Motion carries. We're at 8.03. I'll turn it back over to Ms. Minson. Thank you. There are two policies for first reading this evening. I'm actually going to take them out of order as um, they were prepared for the board, um, with the first policy being JHCDN, Administering Medicines, Naloxone. Um, we entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Virginia Department of Health in order to have naloxone, um, known by the brand name Narcan, available in our school buildings, um, in each of our clinics, and in our AEDs for safety of, of students and visitors if there were to be an open um, an opioid um, overdose where naloxone would need to be administered. So in looking at the policy that we had in place for administering medicines, we looked at our policy currently in place and we realized that the VDH MOU did require us to have school board policies on where naloxone would be stored, how training would take place, um, and how it would be administered and parental notification. So we've created a policy. Um, many thanks to the school board attorney and superintendent in Lynchburg City. They had adopted the um, policy previously, so we looked at their language and added what made sense for our division, but would, make, would ask that the board um, approve first reading of policy JHCDN, administering medicines naloxone. Any questions about this proposed policy? I had, I had a quick question. Um, I guess this is more for Dr. Noonan. In the very last paragraph where it talks about um, Foster City Public Schools will notify students and their parents, guardians of this policy once each school year through electronic communications. And I, I'm thinking, you know, I, I like the last sentence, sentence, such notification shall encourage students to immediately report suspected drug overdoses. I'm just curious, would we be communicating this information via Schoology or what, because, you know, not, no offense, but not all the students are going to read the student information handbook. So right. I just want to make sure, like, what is the, the way that we're going to get this information we'll out? Probably, to we'll probably do it a couple of ways. Um, one certainly is through the registration process, um, another is through Schoology. And then I do know that our school counselors will be working with students in the first week or so of school talking about student rights and responsibilities, and they're, um, they talk about uh, when to report certain things and the like. So I'm sure that it would become part of that as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Smith, I think that's all the questions for that one. All right, and then the second policy for first reading is policy JHCD, administering medicines to students. We figured it made sense when we're talking about administering medicines for naloxone, then looking at our general policy for administering medicines to students. This we had reviewed with our public health nurse and with our shawls at all of our buildings, and thanks to Rebecca Sharp and her help going through it. Um, we are proposing following the VSBA model policy on JHCD with a few changes instead of saying him and his, saying them and their at lines 9 and 12. Um, and then because we are having a naloxone policy, we did add at lines 85 to 90 reference to naloxone within the policy. But otherwise, this follows very closely the language from the VSBA is quite similar to what we currently have in place at 9.38. And we do have two regulations right now, um, 9.38.1 and regulation 9.38R. Um, so my, I suspect that once the board does go to second reading of this policy, we would have regulations that go along with it that address what was um, previously in the regulations 9.38.1 and 9.38R. Any questions about this policy, JHCD, administering medicines to students? Hearing none, those are the policies for first reading. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mizen. Um, could I please have a motion? Yes, Dr. Anderson. I move that the school board approve first reading of policies JHCD, administering medicine stu students, and JHCDN, administering medication, naloxone, as presented. Thank you so much. May I have a second? Yes, Vice Chair Gold, thank you. All those in favor say yes, yes. All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. We're now at 8.04, and I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Minson. This is for the first reading of collective bargaining resolution. Thank you, and good evening. I'll wait just a minute for my colleague Eric Paltel, outside counsel, to join me here, um, since um, he has been very instrumental in helping us get to where we are today. Good evening. Um, hey. Um, so this evening we're bringing forward tonight for first reading a proposed resolution that if adopted by the board would change labor relations in FCCPS. 
Before reviewing the resolution with the board, I wanted to provide a refresher for the board and a reminder for the community of the steps that have led us to this point. Collective bargaining uh, is something that's new for the Commonwealth. Previously in public sector, local governing bodies were not legally permitted to bargain with labor unions or other employee associations. The law changed in May 2021, Virginia Code 40.2-57.2 went into effect. It allows local government bodies, including school boards, to legally recognize and bargain with labor unions or other employee associations as the exclusive bargaining agent of the employees and to collectively bargain and enter into a collective bargaining agreement with respect to any matter re relating to them or their employment or service. Previously, uh, attorney Cynthia Hudson with Sands Anderson was retained by the school board to give advice and counsel um, as it related to collective bargaining. Ms. Hudson, who has since retired, did join the school board for a meeting on March 8, 2022. She shared a PowerPoint at that point in time with the board regarding the change in the law and her advice on moving forward. Since that was about one year ago, I did wanna highlight some of the pieces of Ms. Hudson's presentation. She noted that the law permits, but does not require bargaining. The law mandates termination of any local government employee who engages in a strike and bans such individual from reemployment by the Commonwealth or any Virginia public body for one year. School employees can compel a school board to vote on whether to adopt a resolution. The Virginia Code specifically provides that employees can drop cards, which would then compel the local public employer to vote to adopt a resolution or vote to not adopt a resolution. And the takeaway from Ms. Hudson's presentation was that the performance of mutual legally imposed obligation of an employer through its management representative and a particular group or groups of employees through their exclusive bargaining representative to meet and negotiate in good faith with the intention of reaching a legally enforceable agreement regarding employee wages, benefits, and some or all terms and conditions of employment. The employer is represented by a management representative and employees are represented by an exclusive bargaining representative. So then we get to collective bargaining in FCCPS. On March 8th, there was a presentation and then a Q&A with Ms. Hudson from, um, with a number of questions from board members. Then there were follow-up questions and answer period during the work session on March 22nd, 2022. On April 5th, 2022, the school board took action directing the board chair to establish a special committee to develop a draft resolution for the board's consideration. Through a democratic process, the following people were brought into the committee. Ms. Pam Mahoney, who represented secondary school teachers. Ms. Emily Donovan, who represented pre-K through fifth grade teachers. Ms. Deborah Liang, represented operational and support staff. Management was represented by Kristen Michael, our chief operating officer. Valerie Hardy, the head of schools, also represented management, and I served as a member of management as well. The school board members were Chair Downs and Dr. Demick. The committee was chaired by Dr. Noonan and Ms. Goodell took all of the meeting notes. On behalf of the board, we do wanna publicly thank the members of that special committee. The group met on 15 occasions to work through the details of what bargaining might look like in FCCPS. The meeting minutes from um, each of those 15 meetings were regularly shared with the board by Chair Downs and with staff by the staff representatives. And there was a great amount of work that the committee um, put in that has brought us to where we are today, the first reading of the draft resolution. The information I just shared with you, the meetings that we had, what was covered is all included on our website. We do have a, um, a page, it's our website backslash collective bargaining. On there, there are links to each board meeting where there were minutes and there were informations on collective bargaining. So thanks to John Brett for putting together that website. Um, and as more information is available about, about collective bargaining, I think that might be a good landing page to find more information. Um, so now the collective bargaining committee's work. During our 15 meetings, the committee worked through a lot of details for bargaining. Unlike other states where the National Labor Relations Act applies or where there's a statutory framework that, of what can and cannot be bargained and how bargaining should work, in Virginia, the legislation leaves that open to the local governing body. To state that differently, Virginia law does not establish statewide framework for labor administration. So this board is tasked through its resolution with coming up with a legal framework that will govern labor relations between the board and its employees. The committee spent its time defining who would be considered employees of the board for purposes of bargaining, considering the scope of bargaining, outlining, outlining the rights of employee organizations, labor unions who are interested in becoming the exclusive bargaining representative, detailing the election, the process of elections for certification and decertification of exclusive bargaining representatives, 
and reviewing and agreeing the rights of the exclusive bargaining representatives. There's also a timeline for bargaining, when bargaining will take place, how long certain events can, can last, and when impasse and other procedures will take place, and the steps the parties would take in the event there is an impasse during the bargaining process. So all of that leads us to the draft resolution from the collective bargaining committee that is in front of the board tonight. I'm happy to answer questions regarding the draft resolution, but first wanted to give a high level review of what's included in the draft that's before the board this evening. The resolution recognizes two bargaining units, certified employees and non-certified employees. Certified employees are employees who are required to have a state issued professional license from either the Virginia Board of Education or the Virginia Board of Health to be employed in their current position in FCCPS. For example, a teacher, a counselor, and a psychologist. Non-certified employees are employees who are not required to have a professional license to qualify for their current FCCPS position. Examples of non-certified employees would be paraprofessional, administrative assistant, custodian, or bus driver. Excluded from bargaining are administrative employees who will serve as the management and bargaining negotiations. This includes confidential employees such as the director of human resources and the school board clerk. Also excluded from bargaining are temporary employees, athletic coaches, interns, and volunteers. The resolution identifies that the administration of various procedures within the resolution will be conducted by a labor relations neutral or an LRN. An LRN is an independent contractor agreed to by the board and the, the exclusive bargaining representative or the employee organization seeking to be certified as exclusive bargaining representative um, regarding certification and decertification. The LRN holds hearings, resolves disputes, determines issues of inclusion in a bargaining unit, and determines the negotiability of topics such as really can the resolution, can the board bargain, board bargain over a certain topic. And the last piece that the committee worked on was the scope of bargaining. As outlined in the resolution, as it's currently structured, the initial collective bargaining agreement, or CBA-1, would include wages, benefits, and three to four working conditions, which are specifically defined items in the resolution. The second collective bargaining agreement, CBA-2, expands the scope of bargaining. It is, has all items from CBA-1 are included in CBA-2, plus up to two additional bargaining topics per side, two from board and management, two from staff, as agreed to in the first nine days of bargaining. And the third and any subsequent CBA would be limited to the topics that are included in CBA-2. And it's, it's outlined in the resolution that the school board can modify the definition of working conditions to expand the scope of bargaining. And finally, the resolution states what is clear in the Virginia Code. Any collective bargaining agreement is subject to sufficient appropriation by the Falls Church City Council. This is important as the school board does not have taxing authority and any commitments that the school board makes in a collective bargaining agreement must be subject to appropriation. I feel like I've talked too much. I think that's a lot, but I'd be happy to, um, together with my colleague here, answer any questions you have about the first reading of the draft resolution that is before you. Thank you so much, Ms. Minson. I just want to welcome your, your colleague, uh, Mr. Eric Paltal. Thank you so much for all of your support and uh, advice and counsel. Um, so you all have the actual resolution uh, on board docs, and I know you've um, all taken time to read it over the past week and have uh, given um, great, provided uh, Dr. Dimmick, myself, and Ms. Minson with some great, great feedback and questions. Uh, so I know this is something that you've all poured over the, for the past week. Um, does anyone have any, looking at this document in front of us, any suggestions on edits or additions to this document? Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I suggest that uh, we amend the document in front of us. Um, in two places, under section one definitions, under working conditions, um, at the sentence ending in seek, um, that it read in each successor collective bargaining agreement rather than in A, and strike the last two sentences of working conditions. And um, that's on page four, and then on page six, under section three, board's rights, board rights and responsibilities um, make what's currently 11 number 12 and add a new 11 um, to read, to establish, maintain, modify, and eliminate policies. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Are there any um, 
And so let's just, uh, let's take a second to go back to the working conditions. Um, so can you, so it would say, um, so again, after seek, we're getting the rid of the word A, right? Correct? Yes, so that it would read, in each successor collective bargaining agreement, the exclusive bargaining representative and the board may each make proposals to bargain up to two additional bargaining topics. Herein, quote, negotiated topic or, quote, negotiated topics, excluding those subjects and rights reserved to the board in this resolution, period. Period, and then the rest would be deleted. Yes. And so then that basically would mean that CBA 3 would have additional could you explain maybe what the, what we're sure. getting at? There? So we in for the first collective bargaining agreement, we've established um, four working conditions, and this would mean that in each subsequent agreement, um, up to two, each side could bring up to two um, additional um, items. So in the second collective bargaining agreement, there would be there could be four additional items. In the third, there could be another four, making it so. The first one is CBA one is four items. CBA two adds four, that gives eight. CBA three adds four, gives 12, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dimick. And then the addition to section three as boards and rights and responsibilities as policies is, is one of the most important um, responsibilities of the school board, adding that language into that section. Are there any questions about those two additions? Yes, Ms. Silverman. I just want to stay on the working conditions issue. I'm very, very pleased with how this landed and hopefully excited to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so we are at, um, now what, what we'll do is, now, I believe Ms. Minton for the motion, we can just say as amend, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Dr. Ortiz, sorry, I didn't. Sorry, um, I, I, can, can I offer a couple of discrete suggestions? Oh yes, for, please, go ahead. Um, and I think these are minor, um, but I just wanted to make sure that um, that I didn't drop them. So in a couple of places, I think this is um, um, uh, the the way that the, the the agreement is structured or the resolution is structured is that as the superintendent or a designee that is carrying out the board's duties in most cases. Um, and then in a couple of places, there's like shorthand superintendent slash designee. And I think just for the sake of consistency, I'd propose that those be um, changed to suit that slash be changed to or, and that occurs in the definition of impasse on page four. And then furthermore, it occurs later on, give me a minute. In section 5C, I believe. What's that? F section 5C section in 5 sentence C. one. Did I admit I skipped it? 5C, correct. So, uh, so that'd be a, a suggestion I would make. And I think that that, practically speaking, has no impact on the, on the resolution. And then I have a further question, and I think this is just a clarification. It's at the, um, <clears throat> well, there's a, a section that gets into the, I think it's eight, that gets into the, the mechanics of how we go about doing the work here, and it's in good faith bargaining, 8C. And then it starts off, um, uh, 8C paragraph one says, the parties will schedule contract negotiations at times and places, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that we're referring to actually negotiations regarding the collective bargaining agreement here in this case. And so I don't know what the right language would be, but I think it would something like, we'll schedule negotiations regarding the collective bargaining agreement. Or, or something similar. Ms. Minson, is that, would that be okay? Yes, I think instead of saying contract negotiations, it could say negotiations of a collective bargaining agreement yes, at that, times. That, exactly. Okay, thank you. So those are the discrete suggestions I had for, for changes. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz. Very helpful. Okay, so Ms. Minson, for the motion, we would just say as amended? That is correct. Yes. Okay. So if I could have someone please uh, read this motion. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Chair, I move that the school board approve first reading of the collective bargaining resolution as amended. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. We're now at section 9.01. Uh, 
Thank you. We don't often get applause in this. Uh, <laughs> so I, sorry, it threw me off. Um, so we are now at 9.01 future agenda items. Um, do we have any future agenda items? Nope. Okay. And we're now at, um, and thank you again for those of you in the audience. Uh, we will be in touch with you. Uh, we're at section 10.01, superintendent's report. Dr. Noonan. Great, thank you, Chair Downs. Uh, just a few things to bring up uh, this evening, and again, sort of organizing them by theme of uh, the, uh, the strategic plan versus around um, resource management. Uh, this morning was a great event, and for those of you that were able to make it, we really appreciate it. Um, we did cut the ribbon on our first two electric buses here in the City of Falls Church Schools. Um, these new buses are clean and quiet and safe. And a special thank you and shout out to Kristen Michael, our Chief Operating Officer and Transportation Director, Regina Anderson, who are leading the way on, on this work. And we're pleased to host the students and the teachers from Oak Street and Meridian High School at the, uh, from the Sustainability Academy, as well as community members and our partners. And uh, be on the lookout for these buses around town, because you won't hear them. You have to look for them. So, um, so that's thing one. Um, in terms of wellness, equity, and belonging, um, just a congratulations again to our Meridian High School Boys Swim and Dive team who were state champions this year. Last night, the City Council um, issued a proclamation recognizing the Swim and Dive uh, team. And March 22nd um, of this month will be the City of Falls Church State Champion Meridian High School Boys Swim and Dive Team Day in the City of Falls Church. And uh, we're very excited about that. Um, also want to bring to everyone's attention that next Wednesday on March 22nd, sort of in the context of the conversation tonight at 7 p.m., there will be a, a community-wide screening to learn of, um, of a movie called One Pill Can Kill by filmmaker Molly Herman, and uh, she'll be there to talk about the documentary. Um, and it is a, about a presentation and a movie about the opioid crisis. Additionally, um, it, with that screening, uh, behavioral health specialists from the Fairfax Community Services Board will provide naloxone training, uh, and attendees can register to receive a naloxone kit after that training. Um, and that event is being sponsored by the Meridian High School PTSA, the Falls Church Ed Foundation, and the Health and Wellness Committee. Um, under IB, our history matters. Um, March, as you read tonight, is certainly Women's History Month and we are recognizing it in a number of ways. Um, there are morning announcements and tweets about women in history, and locally everyone can participate in a scavenger hunt style walk around the city all month, looking for signs outside of the schools and shops and other places like the library, city hall, and restaurants, recognizing um, famous women that have ties to the city of Falls Church. And I would invite all of you to participate in that walk throughout the month. Uh, next is MYP projects. Yesterday was a big day for Meridian High School's 10th grade students as they presented their MYP projects. Uh, it was super impressive and they've all been working very hard this year on their projects of personal interest uh, and their enthusiasm about their topics came through. Um, a small sampling of some of the topics were learning to crochet, sustainable gardening, family genealogy, chess, student volunteer opportunities, sustainable clothing creation, and clothing drives for Ethiopia. And I want to uh, send a special thanks out to Holly Garcia uh, and the MYP coordinator at the high school, middle school, Rory Dippold, for the hours of work that they put into preparing this really excellent event and a job well done. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Any questions? Okay, yes, Dr. Dimick. Which bus routes get the new buses? My kid was saying we, maybe the longest route should get the buses. We are, we are in, uh, instituting a share the wealth campaign. So we, um, one, of, one of the reasons for that, uh, each of the bus drivers will get a chance to drive the new buses because we do want to cross train people on both the electric and the diesel buses. So they'll be on multiple routes throughout uh, the city of Falls Church. But it's a good point. You know, have them on the longer runs. Thank you, Dr. Noon. Any other questions? Okay, we're, uh, thank you, Dr. Noon. We're at 11.01 uh, board and student liaison comments. Um, I'll start, Ms. Silverman, do you have any comments this evening? Sure. Um, I, we are kind of in sit and wait mode with the governor signing the budget. Um, I'm told by our uh, outside consultant, Lilla Weiss, that the governor has until March 27th. So um, 
sitting and waiting. That's it. Thank you. Dr. Dimmick. All right, I'm going to say lots of things. Sorry. So I'm going to second um, what Dr. Noonan said about the middle year program projects. I was there last night. It was great. Music, art, coffee, chess, comic books, how to grow an oak tree, um, many interesting things. It was really fantastic, and you should all go next year. Um, I helped chaperone the band trip to Nashville. It was a uh, action-packed four days, and I want to send, um, send out a great big thank you to Mary Jo West for organizing the trip and to my fellow chaperones and the band boosters for making it all happen. Um, some of the highlights were, um, and the trip was for the, for the band and the guitar class students. Um, I think all the students enjoyed the recording, recording session at RCA Studio B where Elvis also recorded. Um, we had a great session with um, a band director from Vanderbilt. And then um, my son and I both really enjoyed the symphony. I think some of the other students did it as well. They have a, an amazingly lively conductor who we sat facing. I thought that was really quite interesting. So that was a great trip. Um, more music things, since I'm talking about music. Um, this Sunday, the jazz bands and the rock bands are going to be performing at the um, MEH Cafetorium. Um, there will be some swing lessons. You don't need tickets. There will be nibblies. So feel free to come out, learn how to swing, and um, you know, listen to music Sunday from 3 to 5. Um, and then as you continue your love of music, the choral boosters want you to be singing um, on Thursday, March 30th from 6.30 to 9 at Clarendon's. You can come and do karaoke. Um, I think my fellow board member, Ms. Tice, will be there. And if there's a contest, she may win since she won the mu music trivia. So, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Dr. Ortiz. Yeah, um, <clears throat> a few quick updates. Um, we had an ESOL advisory committee on March 1st um, um, in place of Dr. Santiago. Um, 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 Mr. Bates joined us and, and provided, uh, and we participated in a really great discussion regarding evaluation, selection for advanced academics for English learners, um, and a whole range of other topics. And then as an, another note is that the ESOL Advisor Committee has um, impaneled a subcommittee to do a deeper dive into looking at um, the data regarding our um, uh, multilingual learners. Um, and uh, to try to understand where there really are um, needs and where there's opportunities for us to provide more services for them. Um, it's been a while since the last um, uh, the, the, the last um, athletic boosters meeting, but spring sports are in full swing. We want to thank our um, girls basketball team for having such a great season, as well as the boys basketball team, and then the swim team did fabulous, as Dr. Noonan noted. Um, I believe that tomorrow is the final date to purchase mulch, and if you buy... 5,000 bags, they will deliver them to you, but otherwise you have to go pick them up yourself. Um, I think, I think, the I think might, it's 20. I think it's 20, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Not 5,000. It, it just feels like 5,000 after you've spread like them. 5, yes. Um, and then, and then uh, I just, uh, and to, to, to pick up on Dr. Dimmick's notes regarding performing arts, so next weekend is the, um, is the Meridian High School um, uh, Theater Department's play. Um, it's a French farce. I don't know what the name is in French, but in English, it's The Love Doctor. It actually includes some original music as well as as, um, as accompaniment, so it should be a really great experience for everybody. So um, if you have time next Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, please join um, join the Meridian Theater Department in celebrating that tremendous, uh, that tremendous production. Thank you very much, Dr. Ortiz. Vice Chair Gould. Thank you. We had a chamber meeting, our monthly chamber meeting this morning, which always went well about all the activities that are going on for connecting the uh, business community. Um, we, there was a Mary Ellen Henderson PTA meeting that I was not able to attend because I was at office hours, but Dr. Noonan attended and presented on the budget, which uh, went well. And then while that was going on, I was at office hours at Speezy's with uh, Chair Downs, where we had a plethora of topics that were brought to our attention and discussion, uh, such as the theory of knowledge course at the, um, and the changes at the high school, uh, feedback on start times, uh, the possible uh, proposal of, of start times at the high school, 
uh, concerned about uh, phasing out uh, AP classes, which Dr. Noonan uh, assured that wasn't the case. IB college credit, uh, internet access by students, uh, composting at schools, standards-based grading changes, uh, calendar feedback, and the Sustainability Academy, as well as uh, diversity at Meridian. So we're, uh, it was a fun-filled evening. Um, we've been working with Dr. Noonan and his staff to address uh, all the questions that came up at office hours. We always appreciate that. So that was, uh, and we have office hours next Wednesday at? Uh, Placa Grill. Placa Grill. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Gould. I have a couple quick updates uh, from Falls Church Education Foundation. Um, they've uh, given another $6,000 towards um, social emotional learning training. Uh, they're stewarding funds for the health and wellness presentation on uh, digital media. They've uh, provided some financial support for the documentary that Dr. Noonan mentioned, the One Pill Can Kill documentary. Um, Home and Garden Tour is April 16th. Mark your calendars, buy tickets, and thanks to all of the sponsors of the Home and Garden Tour. This is a big fundraiser for the Falls Church Education Foundation, and as uh, you all know, those funds go to support our ESOL um, learners as well as um, uh, tr teacher training and teacher staff development, as and then of course super grants. So please support the Education Foundation, uh, Meridian PTSA. Um, again, they're they're one of the sponsors also on the One Pill Can Kill uh, movie and training, uh, Narcan training. They're still, uh, as always, working on all night grad donations. Uh, so that's always a big uh, event for our our new graduates. And on April fifteenth, they're hosting a mock SAT. And uh, Dr. Noonan and I and uh, Ms. Michael and Mr. Bates were all at peak uh, a couple weeks ago. A couple topics that came up, uh, retirement, um, celebrating nationally certified teachers. Uh, we talked about chat G uh, GPT, that it, it can be a useful tool for both teachers and students. Uh, we, the teachers, the staff talked about um, Performance Matters, which is a, a data, uh, I guess, software platform, and Mr. Bates and uh, the central office team is going to work with staff on that, getting some more feedback. And also, um, with us, ch with our calendar policy and having teachers not come back a week early, there were um, some t staff uh, expressed concerns about child care uh, since they have to come back a week earlier. And uh, Dr. Noon and Ms. Michael. Uh, expressed that kids can be brought to work that week if necessary, and Parks and Rec are also working on camps, and they're giving reduced fees to our staff uh, to help with child care. And uh, we also have a section now in Pete called GLOWS, so to really call out things that are great, and I had mentioned this at the top of the meeting, um, that the staff really like class tag, and a shout out to Steve Knight for helping uh, really steward that whole process and answering questions about that. And um, also, one of the things that Dr. Noon and I and Ms. Silverman um, attended, uh, I guess, a week or two ago was um, an anti-discrimination, anti-hate um, forum or student group at Meridian High School. And it was actually composed of staff and students and parents. And I know I speak for Dr. Noon and Ms. Silverman where we found it really um, impressive to hear these students talk from the heart and really see all members of the community come together to, to determine different actions that can be taken to fight hate and discrimination, hate in all its forms. Um, so we really uh, thought that was terrific, and that was also a glow that was mentioned during the PEAK meeting. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Uh, so I, I went to the daycare advisory board uh, last night, uh, and they had an update from the Mount Daniel uh, supervisor. Uh, they uh, recently hosted their second talent show, uh, which I heard has been, was quite lively uh, and quite a success. Several parents came, uh, and they are also going to host a pancake breakfast uh, for the before care uh, on uh, the 24th uh, because some of the kids saw teachers eating pancakes one day and they begged for a pancake breakfast and so the 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 staff at um, uh, the, for the before care uh, are taking really good care of the kids over there um, they had the trips field trips planned out for spring break and summer uh, so uh, I know that uh, my, my kids enjoy enjoy all the all the care that they get so I have no doubt that it'll be a blast for whoever signs up uh, which uh, is also currently Registration is very high, uh, and they have a longer wait list than even since before COVID. Um, so everybody's, uh, I think, 
uh, I think everybody's talking it up uh, for good reason. So they they uh, they have uh, the registration has been quite good. Uh, the daycare bill uh, that would uh, kind of make it easier for um, our um, for FCCPS to kind of do more of the kind of administering things around daycare uh, still awaiting the governor's signature. Uh, it's just kind of sitting on his desk. So hopefully that will be signed soon. Uh, and they are um, they were. Uh, the um, uh, Katie Clinton was asked about uh, how uh, start times and uh, ch possible changes to half day Wednesdays would uh, would affect uh, the uh, daycare uh, fees, and uh, Ms. Clinton said that she was uh, kind of waiting a l on a little bit more guidance from the board decision to update the fees, and so um, I think uh, possibly providing a uh, potential schedule for any possible changes um, would be would be good. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Mount Daniel. Uh, speaking of the arts, uh, my, I know my kids have been enjoying their field trips to my second grader went to the portrait gallery, and uh, I was able to uh, chaperone the my kindergartner's trip to the National Gallery to the modern art uh, part, and he loved it so much that we went back on Sunday, and he would go around and in each room, he's like, all right, so where's Matisse? Is that Matisse? Is that Matisse? Is that Matisse? Uh, and so we finally found some Matisse's and he was very excited. So they are doing a great job of instilling some uh, art appreciation over there. Thank you very much. Lots of art talk tonight on the dais. Yes, Ms. Tice. All right, thank you. Well, I will just continue the art talk. Uh, I went to the uh, Reckon Parks uh, meeting last week and um, and Vice Mayor Hardy gave a great presentation on the art walk that's happening in Falls Church City now, where um, if you go on the, uh, if you, you can look, look on the website, maybe we could put it in the morning announcements. It's really a wonderful program where they've found all the art around town and are putting um, plaques next to the art with the QR codes where you can read about where the art came from and the artist. And there, uh, the website, there are routes you can take around town where you can walk from art to art, whether it's statues or a lot of the public art around town. So that is... That was a really innovative and interesting project that was um, fun to learn about. There is still a, an opening on the Rec and Parks board if there's anybody out there who is involved and appreciative of our Rec and Parks and wants to join. And we spent the rest of the meeting talking ab about the Grand Marshal for the Memorial Day Parade, which is always an exciting and difficult um, decision to make. Um, the Health and Wellness Committee has not met since, not met since January. They'll meet again later this month. Uh, I did want to thank those of you um, who've mentioned the One Pill Can Kill uh, presentation next week. I will be there. I just I think it was mentioned, but in case not, it is designed for middle school and high school students uh, as well as parents. So I will be there with my middle schooler and high schooler. And then I met with the went to the uh, special education advisory committee last week. We met at Mount Daniel, and something that's really nice that th that that committee does is they travel and they every meeting the. First and last meeting are at central office and the rest of the meetings rotate amongst the schools, which is a really nice opportunity for all of the members of the committee, committee to see the, uh, the different buildings. And we met at Mount Daniel and had a nice presentation from uh, Principal Kasich and Allison Klink and um, heard about some of the programming that's happening at Mount Daniel. And then we had a presentation on the annual plan, which is an important part of the committee's work. Uh, there's still, of course, a placeholder for budget since, we're, as we know, we're all waiting for those final numbers to come in. But that was a productive meeting as well. I will note that I will be at the karaoke event, and I'm looking forward to it, and I'm an enthusiastic singer and a floral choral student who has zero talent. So if it was lip syncing, I might be able to uh, have a shot, but no, no chance. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Dr. Newton, you I just have a quick yeah. go back. Uh, since Mr. Kenny George is in the room tonight, I thought I'd uh, give him a shout out too. He was at the Ed Foundation meeting last night talking about his, um, his program. And I just want to put something on the board's radar for future thinking. Think about um, a mobile uh, truck, maybe a 14, 22 feet, maybe 40 feet? 14 is good. good, maybe a 14 foot truck to do sort of mobile recycling of material that can then be transformed into um, something really cool by the students. So we're going to be bra we're going to be brainstorming together about some really cool stuff. But um, just wanted to give him a shout out since he was here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Ian. That sounds very interesting. OK, we're going to move on to uh, Section 12, Approval of Minutes. And I know that uh, Ms. Goodell has sent out the minutes, and you all took a look at them. And any comments or edits? Okay, um, 
so I'd like to move, um, if someone could actually, um, oh shoot, I just lost my screen there. Um, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to approve the minutes of March 22nd, 2022, April 5th, 2022, and April 20th, 2022 as presented. And hearing no objections, the minutes are approved. We're at section 13 materials for board review. Um, you'll see FCCPS enrollment and monthly budget monitoring report for your review. And if um, any other questions or comments before we close out. Okay, well, thank you. And again, as always, um, thank you to the staff for th this evening. Thank you to the teaching staff that's here in the audience and uh, we are adjourned.